The references for this section include EM 385-1-1 Section 6, 29 CFR 1910 Subpart H, 29 CFR 1910 Subpart Z, 29 CFR 1926 Subpart H, and 29 CFR 1926 Subpart Z. Exposure through inhalation, ingestion, skin absorption, or physical contact to any chemical or biological agent in excess of acceptable limits specified in the current American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists guideline, threshold limit values, and biological exposure indices, published by OSHA, shall be prohibited. The applicable standard is the Occupational Exposure Limit, or OEL. In cases of conflict between ACGIH, OSHA, Department of Defense, or Department of the Army standards or regulations, the most stringent requirement shall be used as the OEL. The employer shall comply with all applicable standards and regulations to reduce contaminant concentration levels as low as reasonably achievable, or ALARA. Activities where occupational exposure to chemical or biological warfare agent is possible shall comply with DA safety and occupational health requirements for chemical and biological agents. Activities involving ammunition and explosives or their constituents or chemical warfare agents may have additional requirements specified in EM 385-1-97 Explosive Safety and Health Requirements Manual. Job site operations, materials, and equipment involving potential exposure to hazardous or toxic agents or environments shall be evaluated by a qualified industrial hygienist or equivalent competent person in industrial hygiene operations to formulate a hazard control program. A description of the methods used must be accepted by the government designated authority or local safety and occupational health office before the start of specific operation. This evaluation shall be performed at least annually for U.S. Army Corps of Engineers operations. Activity hazard analysis and or position hazard analysis shall be used to document the evaluation of hazards and controls present. The hazard evaluation shall identify all substances, agents, and environments that present a health, explosive, or fire hazard, the risk of the hazard, and the recommended hazard control measures. Engineering and administrative controls shall be used to control hazards, and where not feasible, personal protective equipment, or PPE, shall be used. The hazard evaluation shall document the nature of the evaluation, the workplace and activity, name, position, and credentials of the person certifying that the evaluation was performed, any controls and training being utilized, and the date of the evaluation. The evaluation shall be documented in a written report and available for review by the GDA or SOHO. Approved and calibrated devices shall be provided to measure hazardous or toxic agents and environments. National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, OSHA, Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, or DA sampling and analytical methods or other independently verified methods shall be used. Laboratories used for analysis shall be accredited by nationally recognized bodies for the type of analysis performed. Testing shall be performed during initial startup and as frequently as necessary. Records of testing and monitoring shall be maintained on site and shall be available to the GDA or SOHO upon request. 
The following methods shall be utilized for the control of exposure to hazardous or toxic agents and environments and shall be followed in order below unless infeasible. Substitution, engineering controls, work practice or management controls, and finally, appropriate PPE. New in the 2014 edition, regular house cleaning, work and break area surface cleaning, and personal decontamination procedures shall be instituted in areas where operations generate toxic dust and fume hazards. Also new in the 2014 edition, the frequency of surface cleaning and decontamination procedures is dependent on the nature of the hazards and frequency and risk from the exposure. Finally, in the 2014 edition, procedures shall be documented in the Project Safety and Occupational Health Plan or Accident Prevention Plan. A written hazardous communication or HAZCOM program shall be developed when hazardous or toxic agents are present or procured, stored, or used on project site. The HAZCOM program shall include hazardous or toxic agent inventory, hazardous or toxic agent labeling, material safety data sheets or safety data sheets, and employee information and training. This table of HCS pictograms and hazards provides an example that's new in the 2014 edition, which is required to be compliant with the Globally Harmonized System, or GHA, changes to the HAZCOM standard. When engineering and work practice controls or substitution are either infeasible or insufficient, appropriate PPE and chemical hygiene facilities shall be provided and used for transportation, use, and storage of hazardous or toxic agents. When irritants or hazardous substances may contact skin or clothing, chemical hygiene facilities and PPE, including suitable gloves, face and eye protection, and chemical protective suits shall be provided. Qualified industrial hygienist or other competent person shall determine the scope and type of PPE required. Special attention is required when working with materials designated with a skin notation by OEL. Barrier cream ointment or other skin protection measures recommended by the manufacturer for specific exposure shall be available for use. When eye or body of any person may be exposed to hazardous or toxic agents, suitable facilities that comply with American National Standards Institute or ANSI Z358.1 emergency eye wash and shower equipment for quick drenching or flushing of the eyes and body shall be provided in the work area for immediate emergency use and shall not be more than 10 seconds from the hazardous material. Emergency eye wash equipment must irrigate and flush both eyes simultaneously while the operator holds the eyes open. Emergency eye wash equipment must deliver at least 0.4 gallons of water per minute for 15 minutes or more, providing a minimum of 6 gallons of water. Water used in emergency eye washes and showers shall meet drinking water standards. Steps will be taken to ensure the water does not freeze or become stagnant. Personal eye wash equipment may be used to supplement emergency washing facilities but must not be used as a substitute. Personal eye wash fluids shall be visually inspected monthly. All plumbed emergency eye wash facilities and handheld drench hoses shall be connected to an approved potable water supply and activated weekly and inspected annually. When personal protective clothing is required, an area shall be established for the removal of personal protective clothing and equipment to prevent further spread or contamination. 
Workers shall be trained in the removal of personal protective clothing and equipment. All storage of hazardous or toxic agents shall be in accordance with the recommendations of the manufacturer, OSHA, and National Fire Protection Association requirements and accessible only to authorized personnel. Disposal of surplus or excess hazardous or toxic agents shall occur in a manner that will not contaminate or pollute any water supply, groundwater, or streams and will comply with federal, state, and local regulations and guidelines. A process safety management program of highly hazardous chemicals shall be employed in accordance with 29 CFR 1910.119 or 29 CFR 1926.64 whenever a work activity involves a process that involves a chemical at or above the threshold quantities listed in Appendix A of the above cited CFRs or a process that involves a flammable liquid or gas on site in one location and a quantity of 10,000 pounds or more as defined in 29 CFR 1926.59C. No asbestos containing materials shall be used or brought onto any U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project or other project governed by EM 385 1 1. Lead based paints shall only be used with written approval of the GDA or SOHO and shall never be used inside a residence, child care facility, or medical treatment facility. All construction or maintenance projects shall be evaluated for the potential to contain ACM or LBP. Lead and asbestos sources are to be labeled and should not be disturbed without proper protection. If infeasible to label each source, a site map may be posted which points out the location of the lead and asbestos hazards. Prior to work activities involving LBP or ACM, a compliance plan shall be incorporated into the APP and accepted by the GDA. A lead compliance plan shall describe the procedures to be followed to protect employees from lead hazards while performing lead hazard control activities. The plan shall include a description of each work activity and controls, employee exposure assessment procedures, including an initial determination and continued exposure monitoring, protective clothing and housekeeping procedures, administrative controls, and medical surveillance procedures. The plan shall also include detailed sketches identifying lead hazard control areas, decontamination areas and facilities, critical barriers, and physical and air distribution boundaries, perimeter or other air monitoring, security, and water generation, characterization, transportation, and disposal. An asbestos abatement plan shall describe procedures to be followed to protect employees from asbestos hazards while performing work that will disturb ACM and shall include description of work activities, method of notification of work involving ACM, description of regulated areas, types of containment, decontamination unit plan, and engineering controls, air monitoring, including personal, environmental, and clearance, and PPE, including respirators and clothing. The plan shall also include housekeeping procedures, hygiene facilities and practices, competent person and employee training required, medical surveillance, waste generation, containerization, transportation and disposal, and security, fire, and medical emergency response procedures. Hazards from hot substances include increased inhalation and skin hazards, 
and burns from the heat. Hot substance work shall consider the following. PPE shall be evaluated for efficiency in hot atmospheres and protectiveness from heat as well as the chemical hazard. Heat stress precautions and measurements, newly added in the 2014 edition, locating heating operations away from ventilation intake air vents, also added in the 2014 edition, if hot substances are being applied to a roof, ventilation intake air vents shall be temporarily relocated or the work shall be completed at a time when the building is not occupied. Runways or passageways, clear of obstructions, shall be provided for all persons carrying hot substances. Hot substances shall not be carried up or down ladders. When hoists are used to raise or lower hot substances, attention shall be given to assure that hoisting mechanism is adequate for the loads imposed and is securely braced and anchored. All persons handling hot substances shall be provided protection against contact with or exposure to radiant heat, glare, fumes, and vapors. At a minimum, roofers handling roofing materials shall be fully clothed, including long sleeve shirts, shoes secured and at least six inches in height, and gloves up to the wrist. Containers for handling and transporting hot substances shall be of substantial construction, minimum 24 gauge sheet steel, free from any solder joints or attachments, and shall not be filled higher than four inches from the top. Piping used to transport hot substances shall have an entry and exit shutoff valve and be made of flexible metallic hoses fitted with insulated handles. Additional controls including fire prevention, protection, and hot work permitting are discussed in Section 9, Fire Prevention and Protection. Protection against hazards from insects and or animals harboring fleas or disease-carrying insects shall include the following. PPE, such as netted hoods, leather work gloves, and high-top work boots worn in conjunction with trousers and long-sleeved shirts, clothing treated at the factory with DEET or permethrin, drainage or spraying of breeding areas, destroying or flagging of nests, smudge pots or aerosols for protecting workers and small areas. Protection against hazards shall also include elimination of actions or conditions that propagate insects or vermin, extermination measures, approved first aid procedures for employees, employees allergic to bee stings shall be encouraged to self-identify to the supervisor and to carry an EpiPen. Inoculation against diseases known to be a local hazard and instruction in recognition of the animals and insects. In areas where there is an exposure to poisonous snakes or lizards, employees shall be required to wear snake chaps or knee-high snake boots in conjunction with trousers and long sleeve shirts, be trained in the recognition of snakes, be trained in proper first aid procedures for bites. In areas where employees are exposed to poisonous plants, the following protective measures shall be provided. Removal or destruction of plants, appropriate protective clothing, protective ointments, soap and water for washing exposed parts, instruction in recognition and identification of plants. When burning poisonous plants, controls shall be instituted to prevent contact with or inhalation of toxic elements contained in the smoke. Anyone who procures, uses, possesses, transports, transfers, or disposes of radioactive material 
or radiation generating devices shall notify in writing the GDA or radiation safety officer of nature of the material or device, a description of intended use, the location of use and storage, and all transportation and disposal requirements. Secure appropriate authorization or permit if any radioactive material or a radiation generation device is to be used on a DOD installation. Provide to the GDA or RSO a copy of all U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission or Agreement State Licenses, Army Radiation Authorization, Army Radiation Permit, and Reciprocity Forms to include NRC Form 241 as applicable. Operations involving radiation hazards or use of radioactive materials or radiation generating devices shall be performed under the direct supervision of a RSO who is qualified and responsible for radiological safety. New in the 2014 edition, when a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers radiation safety program exists at a location or facility that has potential radon-222 emissions from radioactive material use, the more restrictive of the specific limits, the specific license conditions, or the NRC requirements in 10 CFR 20 for radon-222 shall apply. Also new in the 2014 edition, if USACE employees work in a building, structure, or tunnel that has naturally occurring radon-222, then OSHA requirements in 20 CFR 1910.1096 are applicable as specified in section 06.F.14. Operations involving radiation hazards and users of radioactive material or radiation generating devices shall develop and implement a radiation safety program. The program shall be managed by the RSO and based on sound radiation safety principles that shall keep occupational doses and doses to the public, ALARA. The RSP will include plans and procedures for handling credible emergencies involving radiation and radioactive materials. All radiological devices and radioactive materials shall be designed, constructed, installed, used, stored, transported, and disposed of in such a manner to ensure personnel exposures are kept A-L-A-R-A. Users of radioactive materials or radiation generating devices shall post signs and control access to radiation areas. Where radiation levels exceed 2 millirems in any one hour period, users shall use engineering controls, shielding, access time limitation, and or physical separation to keep doses to the public A L A R. A. Users shall secure radioactive material and radiation generating devices against theft or unauthorized use. Storage shall be in accordance with any license or permit requirements. Radioactive material and radiation generating devices not in storage shall be under constant control and surveillance. The RSO shall post in a conspicuous location a sign or signs bearing the standard radiation symbol and the following words. Caution, radiation area, between 5 and 100 millirems. Caution, high radiation area, 100 millirems to 500 rads. Grave danger, greater than 500 rads. Caution, Airborne radioactive area, areas where airborne radioactive material concentrations exceed derived air concentration or DAC limits. And caution, radioactive material in areas where quantities of radioactive materials in excess of 10 times the 10 CFR 20 Appendix C quantities are present.
any loss, theft, damage, or overexposure shall immediately, upon discovery, be reported to the RSO, who will then file a report with NRC in accordance with requirements of 10 CFR 20. Mishaps involving radioactive material or radiation generating devices shall be reported immediately to the RSO. Only qualified and trained employees may be assigned to install, adjust, and operate laser equipment. Proof of qualification shall be in the operator's possession during operation. Laser equipment shall bear a label to indicate the make, maximum output, and beam spread. Areas in which lasers are used shall be posted with standard laser warning signs. Employees whose work requires exposure to laser beams shall be provided with appropriate laser safety goggles. Beam shutters or caps shall be used or the laser turned off when laser transmission is not required. When the laser is left unattended for a period of time, the laser shall be turned off. The laser beam shall not be directed at employees. Whenever possible, laser units in operation shall be set above the heads of employees. When it is raining or snowing, or when there is dust or fog in the air, the operation of laser systems shall be prohibited. Only Class 1, 2, or 3A lasers may be used as handheld pointing devices. For suspected laser eye injuries, immediately evacuate personnel to the nearest medical treatment facility for eye examination. All portable or temporary ventilation systems shall remove dust, fumes, mists, vapors, and gases away from the worker and the work environment or provide air to prevent an oxygen deficient atmosphere. Makeup air for air supply ventilation shall draw air free of contaminants and away from any potential contaminant source. Any portable or temporary ventilation system shall be approved by the GDA before use. New in the 2014 edition, the use of high efficiency filtered recirculated ventilation units shall be allowed when the filtration system lowers the level of any of the toxic fumes or dust from the operation to less than half of the OEL. This shall be documented by an IH or CP through sampling for the contaminants. Note that welding fumes, carbon monoxide, ozone, and carbon dioxide are common contaminants that are not filtered out by most filtration devices. Also new in the 2014 edition, the use of high efficiency filtered recirculated ventilation units shall also be allowed when the unit and filtration are regularly maintained and the maintenance procedure and schedule is written and documented when maintenance is completed. The air is not recirculated into a confined space. The contaminant is not beryllium or chromium. Fumes or particulate from beryllium or chromium are not to be filtered and recirculated. Ventilation systems used to remove hazardous dust, fumes, gases, or substances shall be evaluated annually to determine if the system requires cleaning. The cleaning of the ventilation system shall be part of the written housekeeping program section of the project SOH plan or APP. Silica sand shall not be used as an abrasive blasting media. Alternative abrasive blasting materials are available and listed in Table 6-3. Abrasive blasting operations shall be evaluated to determine composition and toxicity of the abrasive and the dust or fume generated by the blasted material, including surface coatings. This determination shall be documented on the AHA developed for the abrasive blasting activity. Written operating procedures shall be developed and implemented for abrasive blasting operations, including pressurized pot procedures. 
the procedures should be added as an appendix to the APP. The concentration of respirable dust and fume in the breathing zone shall be maintained below any OEL for the material being blasted and the blasting agents or its byproducts. No employee will be allowed to work in abrasive blasting operations unless he has met the medical surveillance and training and experience requirements and has been provided the appropriate PPE. Selection and use of PPE shall be in accordance with Section 5. If reusable coveralls are used, they shall be vacuumed before all breaks and removed at the end of the shift. Clothes shall not be taken home to be cleaned by the worker or family, but shall be laundered by the employer. Air supplied helmets, blast helmets and hoods, dust respirators, earmuffs, safety boots or toe guards, durable coveralls, closable at wrists, ankles and other openings, and safety glasses should be an individual issue item identified with and used by only one employee. Such equipment may be reissued to another employee only after complete cleaning, repair, and decontamination. Daily checks shall be performed by the wearer of PPE to maintain it in good working condition. Rips, tears, and openings of PPE that exposes skin to abrasive agents shall be mended or replaced. Suitable hearing protection, capable of attenuating employee noise exposure, shall be worn inside the blast helmet or hood unless hearing protection is an integral part of such helmet or hood. The APP or Project SOH plan and individual AHAs shall address heat stress under the following work conditions. Conus and Oconus locations when hot and dry or hot and humid environments are forecasted. Work is conducted in semi-permeable or impermeable clothing and or heavy clothing such as arc rated suits. Work is in a confined work environment. Work occurs when the heat index is greater than 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Or work occurs around heat producing equipment such as furnaces, boilers, asphalt pots, engines, compressors, etc. A written heat stress monitoring plan shall be incorporated into the APP or Project SOH plan and shall address training on heat related illnesses and how it can be prevented and the control measures to be taken, methods used to monitor for heat stress, signs and symptoms of heat related illness and first aid procedures, exacerbation of heat-related injury and illness based on various types of clothing, dangers of using drugs and alcohol in hot work environments. In hot environments, the following shall be considered. Potable drinking water and encouraging employees to frequently drink small amounts. Toolbox talks on HSMP, weather conditions, heat-related incidents, work scheduled for cooler period during the day, implementing a buddy system, acclimatizing to heat conditions, providing recovery areas, and encouraging employees to use sunscreen with SPF of 30 or greater. A cold stress management plan shall be incorporated into the APP or Project SOH plan for the following work activities extended work duration in refrigerated rooms, work in cold environments where air temperature or wind chill is below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, extended bare hand work in cold weather, work with hands or parts of the body in cold water for periods greater than 10 to 12 minutes or potential for cold water immersion, working in snow or ice. The CSMP shall address training on the signs, symptoms, and first aid for hypothermia, frostbite, and trench foot, control and prevention measures to include PPE, 
engineering and administrative controls, eating, drinking, and safe work practices, conditions and limitations for bare hand work, air temperature and wind speed readings shall be taken at least every four hours. In cold environments, the following guidelines shall be followed to prevent cold related injury. Warming shelters should be made available nearby when the wind chill drops below 10 degrees Fahrenheit. A change of clothing shall be available if there is an opportunity for worker to become wet. Environmental monitoring required when wind chill drops below 20 degrees Fahrenheit and performed every four hours or is warranted. In cold environments, the following guidelines shall be followed to prevent cold related injury. When the wind chill drops below zero degrees Fahrenheit, the following work practices shall apply. Implementing the buddy system, working at a moderate rate to prevent sweating, providing heat shelters, giving new workers time to acclimate. When work activities that stress the body's capabilities are identified, the employer shall identify it as a hazard in the APP or Project SOH plan. The plan shall incorporate processes that recognize cumulative trauma hazards, isolate causative factors, inform and train employees, provide and implement PPE and engineering controls if appropriate. Hand vibration monitoring and controls must be in compliance with ANSI S2.70. Control measures to minimize hand arm vibration include use of anti-vibration tools and or gloves, work practices that keep the employee's hand and body warm and minimize vibration, application of specialized medical surveillance to identify personnel susceptible to vibration, adherence to threshold limit value or TLV guidelines. Work activities that may impact indoor air quality may be scheduled for after hours or performed in a manner that will prevent exposure to occupants. No smoking to include the use of smokeless cigarettes or cigars inside all DOD vehicles, aircraft, vessels, or work buildings. Designated smoking areas shall only be in outdoor locations that are not commonly used or accessed by non-smokers, a minimum of 25 feet from building entrances. Designated smoking areas shall be located away from supplied air intakes and building entryways or egresses. A mold assessment shall be performed when needed. Assessment and remediation shall be overseen by a competent mold inspector with a minimum of five years experience. This person shall be an IH, microbiologist, or a qualified indoor air specialist, or mold inspector who has been certified by an independent IAQ certifying agency. Some states, local authorities, and host nations also require this person to be licensed. A mold assessment shall be written and shall contain the following. Description of area assessed, size, ventilation, and occupancy. Name and qualifications of inspector. Any sample results. Drawing of the area showing location of samples. Location of visible mold or mildew. Type of substrate it is growing on ventilation sources, and other information thought to be important, potential sources of the moisture, recommendations for controlling the problem and remediating the mold. Causes of mold shall be addressed before completing mold remediation. If the assessment reveals mold remediation is required, then US APHC TG277, Army Facilities Management Information Document on Mold Remediation Issues, and any local, state, or host nation guidelines or regulations shall be used. 
A remediation plan shall be written by a competent mold expert. Mold remediation should not be performed by the same entity that performed the mold assessment. Employees in the immediate area of the mold contamination shall be informed of the remediation, results of any testing and symptoms of the hazard. The employees shall not be in the area during remediation. Post remediation air sampling shall be done in the immediate area and in any areas in the mold spore or vegetative air pathway and compared to outside air samples. All activities which could generate chromium-6 fumes, mists, or dusts shall be evaluated by an IH to determine potential personnel exposure over the OSHA chromium-6 standards. Typical operations include cutting or breaking up of cement surfaces made from Portland cement, painting or paint removal operations, welding using rods or wire with chromium coating, heating or welding on stainless steel, handling or applying anti-corrosive substances or coatings. The evaluation shall include a risk assessment of the type and frequency of exposure and breathing zone air samples and swipe sampling on surfaces in the work and surrounding area as described in 29 CFR 1910.1026. The evaluation shall be added as an appendix to the APP or Project SOH plan. To prevent exposure to chromium-6, materials containing chromium-6 should be avoided when possible. Should chromium-6 containing products be required, justification and similar non-chromium-6 product evaluation shall be conducted and submitted to the GDA or SOHO. At a minimum, employers shall comply with requirements in 1910.1026, 1915.1026, or 1926.1126, and provide appropriate PPE, respirators, decontamination facilities, and a lunchroom or area clean from chromium dust and or fumes. In areas where chromium-6 is generated or used, there shall be a housekeeping and decontamination program instituted. Employees shall clean all surfaces a minimum of once a day or at the end of the shift. At a minimum, all exhaust and ventilation systems shall be cleaned and filters changed annually. Workers shall remove outer work clothing before eating, drinking, or smoking. Employee airborne exposure to crystalline silica shall not exceed the 8-hour time-weighted average, or TWA, OEL. Feasible engineering controls shall be implemented. After all such controls are implemented and they do not control the OEL, each employer must rotate its employees to the extent possible in order to reduce exposure. When all engineering or administrative controls have been implemented and the level of respirable silica still exceeds the OEL, respirators may be used in accordance with mandatory requirements of Section 5.E and 29 CFR 1910.134. Employees shall be trained on the hazards of silica, controls required, any sampling results, and work practices to lower their exposure. Each employer who has workplaces where silica is occupationally produced, reacted, released, transported, stored, handled, or used shall inspect each workplace and work operation to determine if any employee may be exposed to silica at or above the OEL. This evaluation shall be documented in the AHA for the job or task to be completed. Each employer shall implement a medical surveillance program for all employees who are exposed to airborne concentrations of silica above the OEL for more than 30 days a year. Where exposure to airborne silica or other substances is above the OEL, work clothing shall be HEPA vacuumed before removal unless it is wet. 
Clothes shall not be cleaned by blowing or shaking. To prevent the dispersal of silica dust, all exposed surfaces shall be maintained free of accumulation of silica dust. Dry sweeping and the use of compressed air for the cleaning of floors and other surfaces shall be prohibited. All food, beverages, tobacco products, non-food chewing products, and unapplied cosmetics shall be discouraged in work areas.